Creamer Media's Mining Weekly is interviewing Edward Stoke, the Director of Research of the World Platinum Investment Council, which has just published its Platinum Quarterly for the second quarter of this year, as well as a revised 2024 full year forecast. Hi, Ed, it's great to chat to you once again. For some time now, the platinum mining industry has been reporting good ongoing demand, but at prices too low to ensure good long-term supply. How is it possible that demand is good, but prices are bad? It's an excellent question, Martin. And, um, you know, it's something we've been doing quite a lot of work on recently. And, and this sits a little bit outside the scope of our regular Platinum Quarterly, which, which we're publishing you know, now. If you look at Platinum prices, effectively, the, the Platinum price inputs, you can kind of divide into three main categories, which would be underlying fundamentals, economic categories or market-related categories, and then sentiment-related categories. And effectively for Platinum, what we've seen is that underlying fundamentals were the main price-setting mechanism up until about 2010, plus or minus a year. And then since then, we've seen more market-related and sentiment-related factors being the main price-setting mechanisms. And part of that has been as a result of things that have occurred in terms of platinum demand from a sentiment perspective, such as Dieselgate, and then battery electrification of the drivetrain. And those things have kind of factored into a market expectation that future demand for platinum, whilst it might be okay right now, is not going to be sustained. In reality, what we're seeing is the opposite. We're seeing a slowdown in battery electrification, higher for longer automotive demand. And so in theory, we should begin to see those underlying fundamentals return to being the most important price setting mechanism. Now, that's been somewhat masked over the last couple of years by the big increases in the prices of palladium and rhodium. Those have sustained supply. Um, and uh, now that they have come down with a bit of a bump uh, as of the middle of last year, we think, again, that's another reason to expect the underlying fundamentals to return to being the most important price setting mechanism for platinum going forwards. When does that tipping point come? That's the question that's really difficult to answer right now. Um, so effectively, these deficits are being satisfied with above ground stocks. And so ultimately, we expect the depletion of those above ground stocks to continue to a point where that market tightness comes in. And, and then that's the point at which those underlying fundamentals become the most important sort of mechanism for establishing platinum value. And two words, demand stimulation have been popping up at the various platinum group metals mining reports. Should more not be done or could more not be done collaboratively by the platinum industry to stimulate demand for platinum group metals? Well, Martin, I mean, this is what WPIC is here for. You know, certainly in terms of investment demand, our job is to, to try and um, get people enthused about the outlook for platinum specifically and to a lesser extent the other PGMs from an investment perspective. You know, I think the investment community is probably aligned with us in, in terms of having a positive outlook over the medium to longer term for platinum, um, you know, potentially sooner than that as well, if we see those underlying fundamentals come to play. For palladium and radium, I think what you're referring to is is really a lot of the producers have been talking about, they've effectively all got a fairly good longer term view for platinum. But of course, these metals are not produced in isolation. They're produced together as, uh, you know, all coming from polymetallic ore bodies. And so platinum alone cannot carry the rest of them along. You need to stimulate future demand in different areas, different new, new end uses effectively, particularly for palladium and rhodium. And so I think that's the area that a lot of the producers have been talking to. There's certainly research ongoing there in terms of how collaborative it is. You know, I think that's outside of our, my remit really to comment on. But effectively, it's, you know, if we see stronger for longer uh, automotive demand for platinum or for PGMs, um, that includes palladium and rhodium, we've then got the hydrogen economy kicking in later in this decade. And that obviously is positive for platinum and iridium. It's important to remember that palladium is a beneficiary of that. Effectively, with the higher for longer automotive demand outlook, you have to substitute palladium into the catalytic converters to, to displace platinum to be used in the hydrogen economy. And automotive by far remains the sector that buys the most platinum. What should be done with the hybrid and green hydrogen automotive opportunities to halt the loss of market share? Well, I think actually, in a way, the, the, the losses are slowing anyway. We're seeing 
a lot of consumer reluctance to adopt full battery electrification. So in effect, what we've seen over the last two years or so is the early adopters have adopted and they've adopt, for, adopted full battery electrification. They've done that also with a lot of government support in the forms of sub, subsidies and tax incentives. Those have been wound back uh, with a view by the governments that they can wind those down because the you know the economies of scale mean the, the, the cost of battery electric vehicles will fall to a competitive level. And to a degree, we've seen that, principally helped by, by China, which has been overproducing battery electric vehicles. But obviously, we're seeing tariffs come in in other geographies that are making those battery electric vehicles less attractive in those areas in order to support domestic automotive industries that can't compete with, with China on the cost grounds. However, even, even with that fall in the cost of battery electric vehicles in, in some geographies, the next cohort of consumers are just that bit more difficult to convince to switch. They've got concerns around range anxiety and um, a lack of charging infrastructure. A lot of people can't charge at home. The cost of public charging actually erodes a lot of the cost advantages. In fact, in many cases, completely erodes the cost advantages of a battery electric vehicle versus a, an ICE vehicle in terms of running costs. Um, and so, um, you know, they're, they're unwilling to make the switch. So we've seen a plateauing of battery electric vehicle market penetration rates. And because the automakers still have to meet their fleet-wide CO2 reduction targets, they're pivoting to focus on hybrid vehicles in order to try and achieve um, the emissions levels that they need to in order to remain within compliance. And we're seeing consumers are happy to adopt partial battery electrification in the form of those hybrid vehicles. So all of this translates into that higher for longer automotive demand. So I think consumers in themselves are solving the question that, that, you know, that you're posing, really. And if projected to 2035, so 10 years on, how much industrial demand for platinum will likely be driven by green hydrogen? Well, that's a good question. I don't have the number off the top of my head, I'm afraid. But uh, and bear in mind, you know, the further out we look, the less accurate forecasts are going to be. But in effect, this year we've seen, in terms of industrial demand, the hydrogen demand that we classify as industrial demand is in stationary applications. Um, so effectively electrolyzers and stationary fuel cells. Uh, and also some um, transport uh, like marine or aviation and so on, but not non-road transport. This year, we've seen, just in the last few months, actually, a lot of electrolyzer projects in Europe go through FID, um, adding um, around a gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity. That, that's expected to accelerate going forwards. So all of this translates into, you know, we're now beginning to put the horse before, in front of the cart, produce the green hydrogen, roll out the refueling infrastructure, and that should, should then feed into fuel cell electric vehicles, principally in the heavy duty category, then coming through. Most platinum demand for hydrogen we expect to come from fuel cells. Uh, it's about, I think, three quarters fuel cells, a quarter uh, electrolyzers. But you've got to have the electrolyzers and green hydrogen first to, to drive, uh, you know, drive that cart. The numbers, uh, like I said, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think we get to something like three million ounces of total hydrogen linked demand for platinum by 2040. And glass popped up in, in your latest report as being quite a, a major demand driver. Will glass continue to drive in the way it has, you know, on a sustainable basis going forward, do you think? So in our Platinum Quarterly, the, the glass numbers are particularly big for this year. And then part of that reflects a deferral of a, the commissioning of a, a couple of glass manufacturing facilities from last year to this year. So if you look at our, num our numbers, last year's glass number has actually been adjusted down this quarter um, as new news has become available. Uh, and this year's number has, has, has been boosted as a result. Now, we've probably seen a little bit of overbuilding of glass capacity in China over the last couple of years. So we'd probably expect a little bit of hiatus in terms of material new capacity additions going forwards. However, that said, if you look at um, projections for installed wind generating capacity, it's expected to double by 2030. That's versus a 2022 baseline. And you do need additional glass fiber manufacturing capacity in order to deliver the turbine blades um, and other glass fiber containing um, parts of, of wind turbines uh, to meet that, that, that projected growth. So, you know, it is likely that glass manufacturing um, is going to continue to be a major driver of industrial demand for platinum um, over the future. But that significant growth is probably going to take a couple of years before it returns. And what is it about medical, electrical, petroleum sectors that create demand for platinum? Um, well, look, I mean, in terms of petroleum, it's the catalysts that are used in the refineries. Um, you know, the outlook for that is somewhat contingent upon what people expect in terms of you know, peak oil demand going forwards. 
Uh, and we, you know, there's some pretty divergent and uh, rapidly changing views on that. If you look at the medical applications, um, they are very diverse. So everything from cancer treatment drugs to stents, um, the electrodes for pacemakers, um, various other implants. Uh, and that's a sector that is growing pretty consistently. Um, we saw pretty rapid growth post-COVID. That was more of a bounce back, a catch up because of operations and um, non-urgent care that was delayed as a result of hospitals being at capacity during during the COVID period. Um, but what we're seeing now is these treatments are being more, made more broadly available to the world at large. And so, you know, you've got a large addressable population in developing markets that now have access to this kind of medical care or increasingly have access to this kind of medical care. So I think I think medical demand will continue to grow um, fairly consistently going, going forwards. And then in terms of chemical demand, you know, fertilizers sit within that. We need to feed more people constantly. So fertilizers likely to continue to be an area of growth. Uh, and then you've got various different chemical precursors that are used in different parts of the chemicals industry, where we do can see, see fairly consistent on ongoing growth in things like parazinin and so on. So since 2013, we've had uh, something like a three and a half percent CAGR. That's for industrial demand as a whole. And that's probably what we should expect on a consistent basis going forwards. And you're forecasting half a million plus ounces demand from platinum investment. What is going to drive that? And what factors are uplifting the projected 2024 investment demand? So investment's a really interesting space. Now, the first thing I should say is that this Platinum Quarterly, we're introducing a new line item. So we've, we've, we've brought in investment demand uh, in China for, for bar, Platinum bars of 500 grams and above. And that's grown 40% year on year. It's not really new demand. We did reference it in the text last quarter. We've just brought it from below the line to being within our supply demand balance effectively. And then China um, demand for bar and coin of a smaller size is just sits within the bar and coin demand line for the rest of the world as a whole. Um, so this year, as you said, we're expecting investment demand of uh, it's actually 517,000 ounces. And that's split into bar and coin demand of 180,000 ounces, a little bit down year on year. Um, that's due to weaker demand in the US and, and uh, actual uh, disinvestment in Japan. You've then got uh, the China large bar demand uh, uh, sitting at 188,000 ounces, 40% year on year growth, as I said. Uh, but the big factor this year is ETF demand. So previously, we were expecting ETF outflows of 120,000 ounces. Now we're projecting inflows of 150,000 ounces. All of that really came in the second quarter of this year. So we had 444,000 ounces of inflows in Q2. Some of that's been paired now. So actually what we're expecting is um, some disinvestment from ETFs through the rest of the year on um, higher for longer interest rates. Uh, and according to Metas Focus, who prepared this, these forecasts for us, you know, they're expecting the platinum price to move towards the top of its range. So effectively disincentivizing new purchasing there. But I think what's interesting from an investment perspective is why, are, why did we see those inflows uh, what is the interest in, in platinum from an investment perspective? And I think it's very much contingent at the moment on that higher for longer automotive demand. So the traditional end uses are driving investment interest right now. Uh, and then the nice to have is, is hydrogen demand coming in in the next couple of years. I mean, it's coming in now, but it's off a small base, but growing dramatically through the course of this decade. And you're projecting a 7% increase in platinum jewellery demand. Isn't that on the conservative side, given the low current price of platinum and the marketing effort that's been going on for so long into platinum jewellery promotion? I hope so. Um, but uh, I, th I think it's important to remember that, um, you know, our kind of optimistic mantra for jewellery for a long time has been flat as the new up. In, in reality, uh, you know, platinum jewellery demand has, has been tapering consistently since 2013. And um, so forecasting uh, a broad-based increase, every single geography for this year, um, seeing improvements in platinum jewellery is, is in itself quite a, a switch from what we've seen from the last few years. Even China, which has been a consistent area of, of demand shrinkage for jewellery, is expected to turn positive this year. Now, to your point, um, it's being helped by high gold prices. So it's not just consumers that are looking at the high gold prices and thinking what's a less expensive alternative, but it's also in particular the fabricators. So what we're seeing is that fabricators and jewellers are effectively having to fund their inventory. And with the high gold prices in combination with higher for longer interest rates, 
um, that makes working capital requirements greater and so ultimately funding their inventory is more expensive. So we're seeing storeholders and fabricators uh, you know, switch some of that gold jewellery into platinum jewellery, which is, from a fabrication perspective, positive, and that feeds into our numbers. It's got to translate into sales, though. Um, and so, you know, but, but if you have people coming through and they see more platinum jewellery, they're naturally more in- inclined to buy it. And despite supply being down, the mining sector is pulling in its capital expenditure horns on new mines and expansions, and then recycling is constrained. Do you agree that this could, if not corrected in time, cause a dangerous price spike, which could knock platinum use back still further? Well, I mean, platinum use is pretty robust, and and I'd argue that most of the end uses, with the exception possibly of jewellery and investment demand, you know, somewhat price inelastic. Um, And and you could make the argument, actually, that from a jewellery perspective, at least, actually, there are some um, positive correlations between price and and demand to a degree up to a certain point. You know, people want the, the flashiest and most expensive thing until it becomes unaffordable, which is arguably where we're seeing gold sitting at the moment. Um, but I think from a supply perspective, it's the, the mining industry is terribly cyclical. It's really hard to make investment decisions in new production uh, now in the current price environment, but arguably that's what we should be doing. It's, it's particularly challenging for the PGMs, as we've already discussed, because of the polymetallic nature of your body. And yes, you you, know, you might, as a producer, have a pretty confident outlook over the medium longer term for platinum, but, but it's harder to be quite so positive for palladium and rhodium, the other key inputs. Um, so without that you know, high degree of certainty, it's really difficult to make kind of counter-cyclical investment decisions. And finally, Ed, what in your view should be the biggest takeaway from platinum quarterly Q2 and the revised full year forecast for 2024? I think it's you know really the point we've touched upon. We've got really robust demand. The higher for longer automotive thesis is feeding into that sort of investment interest. And you've got to contrast that with um, you know significant supply limitations, both from a mine supply and a recycling supply perspective. You know, fundamentally, that hasn't been reflected in prices yet. Um, but you know, that sort of disconnect can only be sustained for so long. That was Edward Stirk, the Director of Research of the World Platinum Investment Council, which provides insights into advanced platinum investment.